His Frozen Heart, a Pride and Prejudice novella, written by Christy Capps, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Prologue A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Lao Tzu, 7th century BC I hate you, Fitzwilliam, his fifteen-year-old sister screamed at him. For the first time in my life, someone loves me and me alone. You, in caring naught for my desires, had to chase him off with your threats. Have you no compassion? Have you no care for anyone's feelings other than your own? You, who have everything, have taken away the only thing I ever wanted. I love my dearest George. Until this moment I thought I loved you too. But no more, brother. I despise you and your frozen heart of stone. To say Fitzwilliam Darcy was stunned when Georgiana ran out of the room would have been the understatement of the century. He had rescued her, his only remaining family, from the hands of George Wickham, a known rake and womanizer. She should be grateful. She should understand how close she had come to losing her future prospects. However, she was far from displaying any appreciation for his stepping in to save her cherished reputation. Over the next several months, she continued in her course. Stubborn girl. In essentials, Georgiana was a good lass, who gave him many reasons for pride in her accomplishments. In this one area, her shy nature turned obstinate. Who was this female who went from pleasant to irritated to tears in a matter of moments? How was a man to deal with such a volatile nature? The fault was entirely his. After the death of their parents, Darcy had indulged her. She was his princess. He delighted to shower her with gifts, to be the recipient of her smiles. However, his failure to realise she was no longer a little girl had serious consequences. Although he would do everything within his power for her reputation to be saved, it appeared that her trust in him and herself was destroyed. Darcy was still angry at being singularly unable to do anything about his sister, angry at being clueless when it came to how to control the emotions of a fragile female, no longer a child, and definitely not yet an adult. He was devastated that she no longer needed nor wanted to lean upon him for support. The tears she had carelessly wiped away with the backs of her hands had bled into his soul, where they remained permanently embedded. Each drop had frozen as soon as it touched his heart. She was correct. He was an unfeeling monster. No, he was not. Looking out the window of the Darcy home in London, memories of other times he had been called a man of cold stone passed through his mind like an art gallery filled with pictures of the same theme. The pain in his chest went from the sharpness of a sword stroke to throbbing. Despite a series of crushing blows... The physical muscle was as strong as ever. Nevertheless, his emotions, those base feelings every human is born with, were locked tightly inside his inner chamber with no conceivable means of escape. At the age of twelve, he had faced the loss of his mother. At his father's direction, he had forced himself not to shed a tear. In his father's viewpoint, weeping was unmanly. Thus it was not done for a Darcy to make a public display. By twenty-two, his father was gone. Weeks after leaving the haven of university, Darcy had the weighty responsibility of caring for a staff of hundreds, a monumental amount of investments and properties, plus the guardianship of his sister dropped upon his shoulders. He was too overwhelmed to mourn properly. The fawning attention from the majority of his peers, coercing, conniving and using means, both moral and immoral, to attempt ingratiating themselves into his society, disgusted him. Yet it appeared to be his lot in life to have blood-sucking fools try to leech his riches and the honour of his family name from him. There were but a handful of men he trusted. There were fewer whom he considered true friends. There was nobody with whom he confided. He was very much a man alone. Isolation was his safe place. Thus he would not bend to please others. He never yielded or veered away from the course set by generations of Darcy's before him. His father raised him to be an honourable man who viewed duty as his priority. Such had been, at the ripe age of almost twenty-eight, his life's purpose. 
In this, he had failed grievously. Months after leaving Ramsgate, Georgiana avoided him like the Black Plague. One final confrontation with his sister had led to his accepting an invitation he normally would never have considered. Charles Bingley, a man of almost 23 years, had leased an estate in Hertfordshire. With a background in the textile mills from the north, he had no experience in land management. Therefore he sought assistance from the one man he often proclaimed an expert, Darcy. Agreeing to spend two months at Bingley's estate, once the harvests were well underway on his own properties, Darcy travelled from London to his friend's new home. After a rocky beginning, where Bingley's unattached sister attempted unsuccessfully to compromise Darcy into marrying her, thus his reason he hesitated in accepting Bingley in the first place, he pondered the saying from the ancient warrior, A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. He had heard it before, His father had said it often. So had his cousin, Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam. Despite its familiarity, there was a moral principle in the reminder worth stopping to ponder. For the journey in Darcy's life, the insurmountable obstacle as strong as granite and as colossal as a mountain, was the very organ that kept him alive. His heart. During the first social invitation Bingley accepted from his neighbours, Darcy discovered exactly how to make his journey of a thousand miles. He started with one step, one moment in time. Meryton Assembly For he is a most disagreeable, horrid man, not at all worth pleasing. Mrs Bennet, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 3, Volume 1 The last thing Darcy wanted to do was attend a public assembly where he knew no one outside his party. He had arrived at Netherfield Park the day prior. During the night, Darcy was awakened by someone trying to force the locked handle open to his bedchambers. Miss Caroline Bingley. The next morning, he took her brother to task for not setting and enforcing rules for his household to follow. Charles Bingley was a pleasant sort, who was eager to establish himself as a landed gentleman. His father's recent death had left him with a fortune to invest in a property suitable for a young man with deep roots in trade. Bingley's inclination was to follow rather than lead. His greatest weakness in Darcy's mind was that he often thought himself to be in love. However, his heart was fickle. At the last count, Bingley had wanted to marry at least six angels in the last two years alone. Darcy hoped his settling into a property moved Bingley to take charge of his own affections and his sister. "'You must come to the assembly, Darcy, "'or you will be left alone with Caroline, "'who I have no doubt would stay behind "'to keep you company if you did not go,' "'Bingley had teased, "'despite the seriousness "'of her contemptible late-night wanderings "'down the hallways of Netherfield's guest wing. "'Darcy yearned to slap his hands on the tabletop "'to gain Bingley's full attention, "'to stare him in the eye and demand action, "'to take him to task. "'Had he done so,' His words would have been harsh enough to damage the friendship. Of that, Darcy had no doubt. He slowly inhaled and exhaled, calming his intense ire. Bingley's heart was kind and somewhat tender. Therefore, he would treat him as he did one of his staff who had unintentionally erred. He would use an approach far less direct, although he hoped no one would ever see the need to do the same for him. Since being with you at a gathering where I am acquainted with no one is the lesser of two evils, I shall indeed attend. When Darcy had observed Miss Bingley at breakfast that morning, he had not found one glimmer of remorse for her actions in trying to force him to offer for her. Never under any circumstances would he be made to wed her. The younger man grinned. Bingley. "'Might I inquire as to the consequences you are considering "'for your sister's despicable actions?' "'Darcy sipped his perfectly prepared cup of tea. "'A consequences? Oh, yes, well, uh...' "'Bingley rubbed his chin as his eyes darted around his study, "'the smile gone from his face. "'I was wondering if you had any ideas, my good man.' "'Darcy sighed. "'Bingley, this is your future, your home.' the place where you will eventually bring a wife and add children. Miss Bingley will not always serve as your hostess. Darcy sat forward in his seat, 
and figuratively stepped up to the podium for a lengthy oration on the value of responsibility and accountability, another subject his father had spoken of routinely before his passing. He knew the importance of starting with commendation, then finishing with firm direction. Therefore he began, "'You are to be commended for wisely leasing this property instead of rushing into a purchase. Thus you will know whether this would be a good investment by the time your lease period ends.' Bingley nodded, his attention firmly on Darcy, while a grin reached almost from ear to ear. "'I thank you. A good first step, needs followed by a second and a third. Darcy set his cup back on the saucer and pushed both to the centre of the table. "'In truth, had I not been a man of honour, the reputation of your sister could have been ruined, which would reflect poorly upon you. Your new neighbours might possibly shun you, whereupon this pleasant situation would no longer be of benefit. Although Miss Bingley attempts to promote herself as being of the first circles of society, she is seen by my family as grasping at rungs of a ladder far outside her reach. Whatever steps you take from here forward will determine not only the peace inside this building, it will also set the tone for how your neighbours react to your management of the premier property in the Shire. Your choices will also strengthen or weaken your welcome into the temps. Bingley's chin dropped to his chest as his hands brushed down the fabric covering his thighs. The smile was gone. I see. Yes, you are correct, he muttered to himself. All of us have a relative or two who are somewhat difficult, Darcy admitted. His aunt, Catherine de Bourgh, came to mind. As the master of your life, you control how and when you spend time with them. But Caroline is my youngest sister— She was left in my care by my beloved father. I cannot simply abandon her. What would she do with herself? Bingley's plea fell upon Darcy's cold heart. Her actions of last night in attempting to force a compromise reveals her to be on the brink of moral bankruptcy, which means she is far from qualified to be in good company. Darcy stood and walked to the fireplace, leaning against the mantel. I will no longer tolerate a friendship between Miss Bingley and Georgiana, My position as guardian is to protect my sister from any influence that could endanger her innocence. Because of this, although you will be welcomed at both Darcy House and Pemberley, your sister will not be included in any invitation extended to you. I'm deeply sorry about this, Darcy. Bingley looked up, a plea in his eyes. Thank you for not removing yourself from Netherfield Park. I will privately speak with Caroline this afternoon letting her know how displeased I am at her actions. In the meantime, I will consider what can be done to adjust her thinking, so she comprehends her own insignificance. Bingley slapped his hands on the arms of the chair as he rose to his full height. She's already readying for the assembly tonight. I shall study her carefully as she interacts with neighbours she clearly views as inferior. Should I see no attempts on her part to moderate her behaviour, I will have her removed back to town." My older sister can serve as my hostess. This is not as Darcy would have done. He would not have postponed any needed discipline. However, Netherfield Park was not his house, and Caroline was not his sister. Thank heavens for that. He despised her sort. The only value she would bring to a marriage was her dowry. He had no need of more funds, even should Georgiana marry. He neither wanted nor required Caroline Bingley for his future plans. Eventually, he would select a wife to provide an heir. Darcy planned to choose a qualified lady once he reached the age of 30. He required she be an appropriate mistress of his homes, the mother of his children, and the upholder of the Darcy dynasty. He doubted there was such a paragon in Bingley's new neighbourhood. Their arrival at the event was met by silence, as the music faded away and the dancers stopped to stare at the party entering in the room. As was his nature, Bingley rushed in, wanting to meet and greet each person at the assembly. Miss Bingley and Mrs Hurst entered behind their brother, their noses in the air, their opinions of their own worth even loftier than their brows. Mr Hurst, Louisa's husband, departed immediately for the drinks table. Darcy brought up the rear. Taller than the others, his eyes scanned the room, finding nothing or no one of note. The sights and smells were no different than any other country gathering. 
Mothers collected their maiden daughters to shuffle them forward for an introduction, rather like hens with their chicks. Fathers did their duty by presenting their families, then leaving for the card room. He saw a young lady he supposed would be his friend's next target before Bingley had noticed her. While Bingley was speaking with Sir William Lucas, the host of the evening, a lovely woman with a trim figure, dressed in a demure fashion, approached with a matron and four others. Darcy looked away, then walked away. They were not there to meet him. From a distance, he recognised the exact moment Bingley spied the lady. Darcy was surprised drool was not dripping from Bingley's chin. No doubt the young man would be proclaiming his love for his newest angel before the evening was over. Darcy already wished it was over. Choosing a spot as far away from Miss Bingley as possible, Darcy again studied the crowd. There was a large number of ladies sitting during the dances. Men were scarce. Some of the males dancing looked to have barely reached puberty. Some of the females appeared to be uncommonly young to be out in society. Others had imbibed too freely of the punch, as their conjectures about the newcomers grew louder. It made for a raucous gathering. One poor young lady endeavoured to silence a matron from her loud speculations of the annual incomes of the Bingley party. Darcy had not noticed the female when he entered the room. Or had he? He shrugged. It mattered not. Her looks were in no way extraordinary. He noted the dark curls resting at the nape of her neck. Her tresses appeared healthy and clean. Nothing else about her was remarkable. She was slim, about his sister's height, or possibly taller. The yellow of her dress was the same as the inside of the water lilies at his aunt's estate in Kent. When the young lady's efforts to quiet the gossiper proved in vain, she walked off. Darcy looked away, letting her existence pass into nothingness. Removing the timepiece from his waistcoat, he calculated they had to remain at the assembly for at least another hour and forty-five minutes before they departed without offering offence. During the next dance, he noted Bingley was standing up with the angel. Unsurprised at having been correct, Darcy counted the couples. Twelve dancing partners, four of which were both female. By the end of the song, Darcy had counted exactly eighteen males in the room, excluding himself. There were at least twice that many females. When he found himself figuring out the ratio of men to women, he admitted to himself he was bored out of his mind. However, checking his pocket watch, he still had one hour and thirty-three minutes before he requested the carriage to return to Netherfield. Unexpectedly, Bingley joined him by the fireplace. Unwelcomed was his plea that Darcy select a partner for the next set. He offered the sister of his angel as a potential partner. When Darcy looked to where she was sitting, he discovered it was the young lady in yellow who had attempted to quell the vulgar woman with the loud mouth. Disgusted with what Darcy felt was a supreme waste of time, he let Bingley know clearly that he would not stand up with a female who was not from the same elevated status as he was. When Bingley persisted, the explanation spewing from Darcy's mouth was more direct than he should have said aloud in company. She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me, and I am in no humour at present to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles, for you are wasting your time with me. Darcy! Bingley glanced to where she was seated. She may have heard. He could not regret the words, for they stopped Bingley from harping on the necessity of mixing with the local society. After two more dances, he needed something to dull his senses. Darcy moved through the crowd to obtain a glass of punch. Standing close was the lady in yellow. Her back was to him, but she caught his attention when she laughed. It was not a restrained titter like he heard in London's drawing rooms. Rather, it was a full-throated laugh from someone who was overcome with joy. Darcy had no intention of listening to their discussion. They were nothing to him. Oh, Charlotte, she spoke to her companion as she endeavoured to calm herself. I do believe my vanity will survive with no more than a passing bruise. For stubborn and ardently clinging to one's opinion is the best proof of stupidity. Her friend chuckled. Are you speaking of yourself or him? The lady shrugged and wandered back to the gossipy woman. 
Darcy was stunned. What female of his acquaintance quoted Michel de Montaigne? Good heavens! The man influenced Shakespeare and Descartes. Never in a million years would he have thought to find anyone in Hertfordshire familiar with a philosopher so obscure. He was intrigued. Finally, something about the assembly had caught his attention. Darcy's curiosity was roused to the point it needed to be satisfied. Where had she learned de Montaigne? Counting to five, so he did not appear eager, he followed her. Standing close enough, he rudely eavesdropped upon her conversation. Perhaps she had no clue of what she had been speaking. Maybe it was an anomaly, or that she had heard it from a gentleman acquaintance and repeated it without knowing the context. Mama, Her soft tone was in contrast to the matron's. Do you see how well Clara Long looks this evening? The rose fabric and lace on her gown are lovely, are they not? Lizzie Bennet, who is Clara Long to any of you girls? was her mother's tart reply. She is nothing to either Jane or Lydia. You are wasting your time cultivating friendships with the other ladies when there are two single men of wealth and fortune who are certainly looking for a wife. The woman waved the fan she was holding dangerously close to her daughter's face. Pull your shoulders back and pinch some colour into your cheeks, Lizzie. Darcy's mouth dropped open. The young lady had perfect posture. Her skin was healthy. The pink of her cheeks came naturally. No pinching was needed. Darcy failed to see why her mother had made the request. The insult to her own child was obvious. He leaned closer to see how the daughter responded, suspecting she would retaliate like a female cat with its claws drawn. I have no interest in either gentleman, nor do they have interest in me. Her words rang true. There was no hesitation, no quavering. We have no knowledge of their characters, Mamma. Oh, Lizzie, you know nothing of what I suffer. The fan fluttered faster than a bird's wings. What is character compared to a comfortable carriage with fine horses? the current fashions dripping with lace and enough jewels and pin money to see your future settled. Leave Clara Long be. She looks to melt into the paper covering the walls, she's so plain. You waste your time with her. Her daughter stepped back from her parent, whispering below her breath. The music had stopped. Darcy heard. Glancing behind him, he felt for the solid wood of the wall. He was shaken far more than he should have been. No, he was not physically overcome. Perplexed is what he was. He repeated the words he had heard her whisper in his own mind. No act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. His father used to tell him the same. Looking at the young woman as she walked in the direction of the lady with the rose-coloured gown, Darcy realised several things. First, she was likely going to tell the one her mother viewed as a competitor how well she looked. This meant she was kind. Second, she quoted both de Montaigne and Aesop. Third, although she spoke Michel de Montaigne in English, she quoted Aesop in ancient Greek. For the rest of the evening, Darcy watched her like a hawk. He easily justified his actions by telling himself he was merely stifling boredom. In reality, though, he gave serious consideration to comparing her with other females of his circle. Would any of them have sought out another, a possible competitor, to genuinely compliment them, to encourage them with a kind comment, to raise their value in their own eyes? His aunts, Lady Catherine and Lady Matlock? No, neither of them felt the need to come down off the pedestals they kept themselves on to elevate someone other than themselves or their own daughters. Miss Bingley or Mrs Hurst? Never. They had not stopped speaking ill of the populace of Meryton since Bingley announced his plans to attend the assembly. Their nature was to criticise and find fault with every aspect of the people and the occasion. His sister? Until Ramsgate, he would have been confident in her kindness. Now that she was heartbroken and disappointed in Darcy, he could not, in truth, be assured her Christian graciousness was still intact. The lady in the rose gown, Miss Clara Long, smiled. Then she blushed as her eyes twinkled in the candlelight. 
When she walked away from the young woman who had extended the compliment, she appeared taller and more confident. The friend, for she acted a friend, in the yellow gown returned to the chair close to where Darcy and Bingley had earlier stood. Her mother had called her Lizzie. Lizzie was far too inelegant a name for someone familiar with ancient literature and languages. Elizabeth, most likely. When her friend joined her, Darcy realised he could hear bits of their conversation from where he was standing. Good heavens! If he could hear them, surely Miss Elizabeth had heard the harsh words he had uttered to Bingley about her. In fact, Bingley had indicated she might where he had passed his insult off as being appropriate to his station compared to hers. He had to admit the limits of his kindness were far inferior to hers. Amazed, Darcy gave serious thought to what had happened. For the rest of the time at the assembly, he became a studier of character. By the time the evening ended, he had witnessed several humanitarian acts of generosity and empathy by many in attendance. Miss Bingley had been wrong. Their country neighbours had not treated their new neighbours in the manner the newcomers, including himself, had treated them. Darcy was embarrassed. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, was a proverb he had cut his milk teeth on. He never should have spoken harshly against an unprotected female. Had a man done such to Georgiana, Darcy would have called him out. In his chambers that night, with his door firmly secured against a possible interloper, he considered the woman in the yellow gown. For a certainty he was not attracted to her. She was not of the haute ton. Nevertheless, she was a lady of intelligence, an unexpected find in the county. Tossing back the brandy his valet had poured before retiring for the night, Darcy decided not to think on her any more. He had more pressing matters to spend his waking hours upon. If only he was able to control his dreams... Lucas Lodge. He has a very satirical eye, and if I do not begin by being impertinent myself, I shall soon grow afraid of him. Elizabeth Bennet, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 4, Volume 1. Darcy had mixed feelings about attending a soiree in the home of Sir William Lucas. His inclination was to stay behind, to enjoy the meagre offerings in Netherfield's library, yet the promise of furthering his investigation of the Lady in Yellow intrigued him. What a funny sort of female she was, in an odd sort of way, hardly noticeable. Additionally, Bingley had extracted a promise from his sister that she would behave with dignity and decorum. Darcy wanted to snort when he had heard. Caroline Bingley would be another female Darcy would ignore. True to form, Bingley had identified Miss Jane Bennet as the current bearer of the title of Angel. He swore his full devotion to a woman he had known less than a week. Darcy longed to roll his eyes at the ridiculousness of it all. Bingley was a good man, an amiable fellow, who had a serious weakness where beautiful females were concerned. And Miss Bennet was beautiful, though she smiled too much. At least her teeth were straight, and none were missing, so Bingley had that in his favour. Nonetheless, it was not her who had caught Darcy's eye. Bingley said the lady in yellow was Jane Bennet's next youngest sister. Despite having the same parentage, the two females were as unalike as day was to night. Possibly Miss Elizabeth was a blue stocking, a female who militantly travelled where other ladies avoided, libraries and book rooms. No, she was not militant. She was kind. It was this mixture that interested him. His resolve that evening was to observe her, to study her contact with others, to see if she deposited any other gems of wisdom and knowledge. He easily admitted to himself that he was not attracted to the dark-haired lady with the yellow dress in a romantic sort of way. It was only mild curiosity, of course. It would help him pass the time until they could return to Netherfield Park. And it would benefit Georgiana for him to note the activities of an intelligent female in country society. After all, the Darcy's primary home was in Derbyshire, a wilder, more isolated northern county. Eventually, Georgiana would marry. Then her responsibility would be to run a similar estate with her husband, while rearing children, blessed with a keen sense of understanding. As an unattached man, Darcy needed all the help he could get, without asking someone, as if he was deficient in knowledge. Never. 
With this goal in mind, he stepped into the carriage for the trip to Meryton, where the Lucas family lived. He had a purpose, a mission. Darcy only hoped the two eldest Miss Bennets would be in attendance. If not, he would do as always, stand aloof so no one would approach. Not long after arriving at Lucas Lodge, Darcy had the opportunity to discover more about Miss Elizabeth. Sir William Lucas, their host, bade her stop for conversation while he was standing next to Darcy. Miss Elizabeth, you are looking well this evening. The older man bowed. Have you been introduced to Mr. Darcy? She looked Darcy directly in the eye. Miss Elizabeth was a bold one. He swallowed, hoping against hope it was not a gulp. Her eyes were the colour of rich chocolate and autumn and the fields after they had been ploughed. Darcy wanted to scoff. No sane woman wanted to hear her eyes compared to dirt. However, to him, the smell of freshly turned earth, the dark brown of healthy soil, was the most valuable asset belonging to Pemberley. It sustained hundreds, fed herds and flocks, and was the true source of his wealth. Her lashes were long and black. The tips on the bottom row touched her cheeks. Amber and gold flecks dotted her iris. The whites were pure as snow. Her brows were arched. Despite one lifting in inquiry, he could not look away. I know who he is, Sir William. Dipping into a curtsy, Miss Elizabeth returned her gaze to his face. Was she examining him as closely as he had done her? He was not sure. Nor was he certain how he felt about her surveying him with the same measure his cook would use to select a cut of meat at the butcher's shop. Yes, she was as bold as brass. But was it based on intelligence or pure brashness? He determined to find out. Miss Elizabeth, I wondered if I might ask you a question about Meryton. Was his first volley? You may. She was politeness itself. Is there a bookseller you favour? There is. Which section do you find most interesting? Here is where most females failed. If they read at all, they tended to favour gothic novels, fashion plates, or the gossip section of the circulating paper. The one to the far left when you entered the door. She had no hesitation with her reply. He barely contained his laughter. Her eyes squinted, her head tipped to the side. Why do you ask? Is there a section or an author you prefer, Mr. Darcy? Perhaps the sporting or the gentleman's magazine? Well done. He bowed to her quickness. As she had done, he replied with a question of his own. Perhaps your choice is La Belle Assemblée or Belle's Court and Fashionable Magazine addressed particularly to the ladies. This time it was he who lifted his brow. She gave an unladylike snort. Darcy could not contain his chuckle. Sir, my goal in reading is both for the improvement of my mind and the pure enjoyment gained from an intense period of time spent with the written word. The corner of her mouth lifted slightly. The section to the far left in the bookstore contains shelves of books filled with history, philosophy and science. There is not one novel to be found in this bookcase. Where would they be housed? He simply could not help himself. She was too witty by half. Why, sir, they would be where every lady would look, next to the mirror on the wall by the front counter. Miss Elizabeth's smile was coated in glee. I'm quite familiar with this section, too. Do we have this in common? We do. She was delightful. To put her even further to the test, he quoted, Thus we both should gain our prize, I to laugh and you grow wise. Jonathan Swift's An Epistle to a Lady. She was correct, and he was flummoxed. He was ready to ask if she had opportunity to read Gulliver's Travels, when Sir William drew their attention to the room. Furniture was being pushed back, carpets were being rolled, and another Bennet sister was doing finger movements on the pianoforte, readying herself to perform. Dancing was to be the entertainment for the evening. He groaned. Then he realised he could extend their conversation if he stood up with her. Darcy requested to be allowed the honour of her hand, but in vain. Miss Elizabeth quickly replied, While I thank you for the compliment, I have no intentions of dancing this evening. 
My time will be better spent in conversation with my friends. Sir William attempted to shake her purpose. He too failed. Miss Elizabeth bobbed a curtsy and removed herself from their company. At first, Darcy felt the fool. He had never before been refused a dance. Then he had to exercise self-control to keep from smiling. Miss Elizabeth Bennet had, over the course of two interchanges, proved herself to be kind, intelligent, courageous and stubborn. Not once had she attempted to deliberately catch his attention or seek him out. Not once had she batted her impressive eyelashes or pursed her lips, as he had seen Miss Bingley do many times, apparently thinking it made her more attractive. No, Miss Elizabeth did nothing to draw his focus to her character or her form. As he watched her walk away, Miss Bingley approached. I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. How dare she presume to know his thoughts. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this manner, in such society. And indeed, I am quite of your opinion. I was never more annoyed. The insipidity, and yet the noise, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of all these people. Pray, might I hear your strictures on them? Your conjecture is entirely wrong, I assure you. The pleasure Darcy was feeling at his next comment was at Miss Bingley's expense. He could foretell her reactions in advance, like he knew the ending to one of Georgiana's novels. I have been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can bestow. Miss Bingley immediately fixed her eyes on his face and desired to be told which lady had inspired such reflections. Darcy replied with great intrepidity, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss Elizabeth Bennet? repeated Miss Bingley. I am all astonishment. How long has she been such a favourite? And pray, when am I to wish you joy? He listened to her with perfect indifference while she chose to entertain herself in this manner. While she spoke at length about the lack of quality in the evening's attendees, Darcy paid her little attention. As far as he was concerned, this sealed her future. For a certainty she would never be welcomed at any of his houses, despite what discipline she received from her brother. Darcy looked away from her and stepped from her side. He would consider her no more. Instead, his mind truly was more agreeably engaged. By the time the Bingley's party returned to Netherfield, Darcy had no reason to repine. Throughout the evening, he had analysed Miss Elizabeth like an entomologist studied an arthropod. While she was certainly different than most females of his acquaintance, he convinced himself it was in relief from the incessant boredom that plagued him at social occasions that explained his focus upon her actions. He had absolutely no interest in pursuing her for any other reason. Why, he scoffed at the idea he had any romantic inclination towards her at all. Whatever his reasoning, the evening had passed far quicker than he had imagined when they had left Netherfield. He chuckled to himself. Their brief conversation had been delightful. Although he often read the sporting magazine, he never picked up a copy of the gentleman's magazine. Why would he? He had been raised from birth to be a gentleman. He had no need to follow fashions set by Lord Byron, a rake of the first order. He did not desire the approbation of his peers. Darcy sucked in a mouthful of air. His cold heart was coming to the fore. He was as critical of the available company as Caroline Bingley had been, which was intolerable. The warmth of close companions interesting enough to allow him to invite them closer would go a long way in thawing his frozen heart. Yet, to succumb to the influence of others was both against his nature and a danger to the habits he had long cultivated. Was he able to change? Did he genuinely want to? Miss Elizabeth Bennet had been his first step forward the night of the Meryton Assembly, nothing more. Had he made another step at Lucas Lodge? He had learned much from the group gathered at Sir William's estate. Mrs. Bennet was vulgar and vicious toward any child except the eldest and the youngest Bennets, whom she favoured. Loudly she had proclaimed her next youngest, Miss Kitty, as an irritant to her poor nerves from her incessant cough. 
Her middle daughter, Miss Mary, was ill-favoured because of her preference for severe styles of grooming and a chronic habit of using Fordyce's sermons to set herself apart as the superior-minded sister. However, Mrs. Bennet complained the longest and loudest about Miss Elizabeth. Darcy shook his head as he gazed steadily into the roaring fire, heating his bedchamber. He had known the comfort of a mother's love and devotion. His own parents had adored their children. Mrs. Bennet? Several times he had wanted to stalk across the room and place his big palm tightly over her mouth. Lizzie will never marry. Who would want her? I cannot imagine what Lizzie is about. She does nothing to make herself attractive to a single man. We will have to support her until Mr. Bennet dies and we are cast out of Longbourn. Then I am done with her. She is on her own. Lizzie is nothing next to Jane or Lydia. Mrs. Bennet had leaned closer to Lady Lucas, as if she were sharing private matters, though her voice was strident. Mark my words, those two will be the first to marry. It is hoped they will wed wealthy men who will not mind the responsibility of supporting the others. Miss Elizabeth had to have heard it all. Nevertheless, she had not reacted with anything other than a slight increase in the pink of her cheeks. Darcy yearned to silence the vulgar woman. Better had the mother remained quiet. Glad his stay in Hertfordshire was temporary, Darcy refused to concern himself with the foibles of the families who had long lived in Meryton. The people were nothing to him, even Miss Elizabeth, who had chosen not to stand up with him for a dance. He chortled. Darcy's inclination was to take a notice out in the papers to let grasping women know their lives would not end if they did not stand up with Fitzwilliam Darcy. He was tired, weary of being a target. Yet why did it bother him that it was Miss Elizabeth who had been the first to refuse him? Compared to the young ladies of the first circle, she was an unknown. How or why would he care about her? The difference in wealth and connections between Mr. Darcy of Pemberley in Derbyshire and the Bennets of Longbourn in Hertfordshire was as broad as the sea separating England from France. Huffing, Darcy refused to argue with himself or think on Miss Elizabeth any longer. He would consider something entirely unrelated, such as a drainage plan for the wheat fields to the west of the main house at Netherfield. The water in the ditches flowed sluggishly. Never would he have allowed his property to be ill-kempt. Admitting that few smaller landholdings had the army of staff he did, he could not criticise Netherfield's steward for a lack of initiative. The rest of the parcels were in good order. Recalling the places he and Bingley had ridden with the estate manager that morning, Darcy noted he needed to remind Bingley of the necessity to repair the fence line between Netherfield and their neighbours, the Bennets. Some of the rails were down. He growled as a vision of Miss Elizabeth popped back in his head. Forcing it from the place the picture had lodged behind his eyes, Darcy thought of Georgiana. However, while the last conversation between the brother and sister had started well as they discussed him finding a new master of the Italian language, it had ended in discord. Rubbing his hand over his chin, he pondered why females were so difficult, while men were easy. All a male needed was a comfortable bed, productive employment, good food, an interesting book, and a loyal dog as a companion. Ladies, they demanded the best goods, the majority of his time and attention, and peers with whom to share the latest gossip. A picture of Mrs. Bennet encroached rudely in his mental vision. He wanted to slap himself to get it out. Miss Elizabeth, in her yellow dress at the assembly, attempting to quiet her mother, was a far more enjoyable portrait to have imprinted on his brain. Bending close to where her mother had been sitting, her profile showed her form with all its exquisite curves. What? A gentleman did not notice a lady's figure, the roundness of her... Pressing his fingers into his eye sockets, he recited, Mone, moneo, monere, monui, monueram, monuero, monebo, monebam. Latin conjugations of the word warn. Darcy needed to heed the warning not to think of Miss Elizabeth. In the past, Darcy prided himself on his ability to contain his actions and thoughts until they were strictly regulated. In his own thinking, that ability separated him from the rest of those in society who made decisions on a whim. 
or people like Wickham, who gave in to selfish cravings with little thought for consequences. Darcy always considered consequences. Or did he? Hmm. Rubbing his chin, he focused on its current issue, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Perhaps the better act would be to test himself. For a certainty, he did not find her attractive. Well, except for those glorious eyes. Yet the next time they were in company, he would ignore her, proving to himself she had no hold over him. He would rise to the challenge. Egredere subigere would be his motto. Go forth and conquer. Netherfield Park, Part 1 There is meanness in all the arts which ladies sometimes condescend to employ for captivation. Mr Darcy, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 7, Volume 1 Using poor judgment, Miss Jane Bennet had ridden a plough horse to tea with Bingley's sisters, in a downpour. By the time Darcy and Bingley returned from dining with the newly arrived militia commander, Miss Bennet was ensconced in one of Netherfield's guest rooms with a cold. Bingley fretted. Darcy admitted it was a mean art, most likely at the hands of her manipulative mother. Mrs Bennet's eldest unmarried child had landed in the same house as two single wealthy men, her mother had to be rubbing her hands together with glee. The lengths some parents would go to get their chicks out of their nests disgusted Darcy. Of course, it was not his only reason for irritation. He was also disappointed how lax Bingley was being in getting rid of his younger sister. Caroline Bingley had reached her majority the same month Darcy had rescued Georgiana in Ramsgate. She could be set up with her own establishment in town, should Bingley insist. Darcy growled. Bingley was not insisting. Instead, he spoke of Miss Bennet constantly, most likely forgetting he had a sister remaining in the house. When Miss Elizabeth arrived at Netherfield Park the next morning, after walking the three miles in the cool, damp weather, her face vibrated good health and vigour. Darcy's eyes refused to move away from her form. How is my sister? She looked at no one other than Miss Bingley. As well as can be expected, Caroline snipped. Darcy longed to roll his eyes. Might I be directed to her room? Before Bingley or his sister could reply, Darcy jumped up. Certainly. What in the world was he about? He was acting like he could not vacate the room quickly enough. Had his chair caught on fire? Were his shoes smouldering? Was he in that much of a hurry to be in her company? Or had his sense of good manners been heightened by observing the utter failure of Caroline Bingley's lack of decorum? Darcy honestly could not say, nor was he willing to admit to himself that he was acting against his own character. At least he had captured her attention. Of course, he had caught the scrutiny of Miss Bingley too. With a small shrug at his own ridiculousness, he performed the task of Netherfield's hostess by escorting Miss Elizabeth upstairs to see Miss Bennet. You walked all the way from Longbourn to Netherfield Park. Darcy was impressed how her care for her beloved sister meant nothing would keep her from Miss Bennet's side, not even hems covered in several inches of mud. Either that or I rode a very short horse, she quipped, while looking down at the bottom of her skirt. He could no more stop his chuckle than reach up and touch the sun. To reclaim his dignity, he commented, There is nothing like being out of doors, is there? She glanced at him with a quizzical brow. No, there is nothing like it. With that said, I will confess, there is nothing like being indoors as well. Well, that volley had not gone well. You must love your sister, was the only thing he could come up with to continue the conversation. When both her brows rose almost to her hairline, he wanted to smack himself in the forehead. Of course she loved her sister, with the exception of Charles Bingley, who did not adore their closest family members. His glib tongue had failed him. Sir, are you well? It both irritated and satisfied him that she had asked. I am well. Mr Darcy, I understand your yearning to learn of my sister's welfare. She is the loveliest of females, with a tender heart, who never sees wrong in anyone, nor holds on to anger even under the most miserable circumstances. Miss Elizabeth's eyes warmed at her subject. She is without peer. 
She thought he was attracted to Miss Bennet. Of course not. He held no attachment to any female other than Georgiana. No woman unrelated to him had held his interest other than briefly, including the one standing next to him. Definitely not Miss Jane Bennet. If he was going to select one of the girls of Longbourn, it would be... What? Good heavens! He gulped. Standing close enough to her that he could smell a hint of lavender, a sudden dread filled his chest. Was his heart telling him one thing, while his brain was saying something entirely different? It could not be. His heart was a frozen receptacle of unused feelings and... emotions. No, he had no emotions. He prided himself on his stalwart control and lack of response to the normal irritations appearing to plague other men. He had only admitted to himself that he had taken a single step on his journey of a thousand miles. When had he run ahead like an out-of-control stallion? He needed to withdraw, to reconnoiter, as Richard would say. Without acknowledging her last comment, he pointed to the door where Miss Bennet rested and excused himself leaving her standing alone in the hallway. Walking quickly, he entered his chambers and closed the door. Where was his anger, that heavy cloak which had encased his every thought for the past four months since Ramsgate? No, for the past five years, since the loss of his father. Where was his bitterness that overrode anything most mortal men would find to be even minimally pleasant? Where was his despair from the overwhelming guilt at having failed his beloved sister, from the fear that had set in at the Darcy name almost being destroyed. Had he shed them like Georgiana's favourite pet Corgi shed her fur, without effort or thought? A picture of his sister in tears, while a maid packed her trunks to depart Ramsgate, settled in his mind. She had been devastated beyond measure. Her fifteen-year-old heart was shattered at the hands of a rogue. As Darcy considered the time since July, the quickened pace of his heartbeat, the tightening of his fists, and the heat rising up his torso, was familiar, comfortable. Yet, he rubbed the back of his neck as his eyes closed, his shoulders bending under the weight of self-recrimination. The truth was, he was undeserving of happiness. What did he even know of the emotion? Nothing. Yet shards of pleasure and interest that had lightened his mood while in conversation with the young lady attending her elder sister, albeit momentarily, had been... wonderful. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Since his arrival in Hertfordshire, he had moved forward. Rather than castigating himself for his progress, he should be rejoicing, should he not? Nevertheless... Why were the positive moments associated solely with Miss Elizabeth? Was there nothing or no one else to inspire good? Sitting alone in his chambers, he stretched his legs forward and focused on the polished toes of his hessians. They were without flaw. Thornton, his valet, would allow for nothing less. In the same manner, Darcy had fought and struggled to elevate the whole of his life to the same standard. Nonetheless, for the past four months and even prior to that if he was honest with himself. Discontent and error had crept in like tendrils of mist from the Thames in the autumn mornings. Comments from his father, and even his mother while she had been alive, left him certain as to his course from his infancy. "'Be proud you are a Darcy,' his father had echoed. "'You are the grandson of an earl,' his mother had chanted. "'Hold yourself ahead of the crowd. You are from a long line of nobles.' his grandmother repeated daily until her death. Sadness at the loss of his loved ones was acceptable. Sadness at his failure to uphold the Darcy name was not. Therefore, anger had been his constant companion. Anger at George Wickham for daring to bring harm to Georgiana's reputation. Anger at his parents for dying, leaving him a hefty burden, with no help from a wise counsellor outside the family. Anger at society for pushing and prodding him to generously share his wealth and circumstances until he would have nothing left. Mostly, Darcy admitted, his anger was towards himself. So was his sister's ire focused on him, deservedly so. He had interviewed and hired Georgiana's worthless companion. He had chosen not to warn Georgiana about unscrupulous men like Wickham. It had been he alone who had rented the seashore cottage for his sister. 
His dark thoughts were slowly but surely rooting out any good of the past week, while the happy countenance of Miss Elizabeth felt nice, his mind convinced himself it was not healthy. Moving to the writing desk, he pulled out parchment, the bottle of ink, and a pen. He would do as he had done since inheriting Pemberley. He would write down his thoughts, then read them back, before destroying the list. Within moments his quill was flying over the paper. Down the middle he had drawn a line. On the left side he listed his sins. Those were easily done. The other column was a tally of the good he felt since his arrival at Bingley's estate. Once done, he carefully placed the pen in its holder. Then he took it up again. Examining the left side carefully, he crossed out those areas where he had no control. Marks covered Georgiana at Ramsgate, Mother's Death and Father's Death. While they were greatly disturbing, he could no longer do anything to change what was done. Also marked out was society's expectations. What control did he have over others? None. Besides other small inconveniences, there were two glaring wrongs left on the page. George Wickham and presumed engagement to my cousin by my aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Richard, who happened to be Georgiana's other guardian, had wanted to hunt Wickham down and run him through after Ramsgate. Darcy had stopped him out of fear, word would get out and his sister's future would be in tatters. As to the constant harping of his aunt to attach the Darcy name to hers, Lady Catherine rarely left her estate in Kent, so her ability to carry her point to engage Darcy to his sickly cousin Anne was moot. Nevertheless, this could not excuse his not taking action against either. Running his finger over the words, the smear made both Wickham's and Lady Catherine's names illegible. Darcy smiled. With little effort on his part, he could settle these issues. A letter to his aunt decrying any intention of wedding her daughter could be easily done. For Wickham, a short note to his man of business in London would have the pile of debts Darcy had bought up, gathered to be presented for collection to the miscreant. Undoubtedly Wickham would be unable to pay. Thus his sorry hide would rot in Marshalsea, where no one would believe whatever slander he chose to share. Darcy's eyes looked to the right side of the page. Two words glared back at him. Wiping his fingers on a cloth, he rested his chin in his palm. Whatever was he to do about those two words? Six syllables, fifteen letters. He considered wiping his finger over them to smear the writing, as he had done on the left side. His hand hovered over the column. However, he could not. Folding the paper to hide the name, he rose and tossed it into the fire. If only Elizabeth Bennet could be banished in person as easily as the ink and paper had been. Netherfield Park, Part 2 And now despise me if you dare. Elizabeth Bennet, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 10, Volume 1 Visiting hours brought Mrs Bennet and the rest of her brood to Netherfield Park, by the time they reluctantly removed themselves back to Longbourn, Darcy had realised three things. First, Mrs Bennet and Caroline Bingley were similar in attitude and approach, which would have horrified Miss Bingley to know. Both were convinced marriage was needed to at least one resident of Netherfield Park to increase their whole family's status and security. The second was how dissimilar Mrs Bennet and Caroline Bingley were, where Miss Bingley was willing to overlook Darcy's lack of interest in her society for the sake of becoming the next mistress of Pemberley, Mrs Bennet was not. Like her daughter Miss Elizabeth, the mother did nothing during her short visit to carry Darcy's favour or to promote any of her chicks to him. Instead, her goal was the ever-hospitable Mr Bingley. Darcy could not fault her. Would he want his beloved sister permanently attached to a man with a paucity of human feeling, someone cold-hearted and distant like himself. Not at all. Although his opinion of Mrs Bennet was 99% to her disfavour, that 1% weighed heavily on the scales of what was right and just. She would much rather have her favoured eldest daughter wed to a kind, caring man, despite his income being less than half of Darcy's. However, it was the third item Darcy learned that disturbed him the most. 
Mrs. Bennet had challenged Darcy on a point she misunderstood. Miss Elizabeth jumped in with a quick explanation that not only diffused a potential insult, it did so to his benefit. He was stunned. Had he truly been fighting his battles alone for so long that any defence of him stood out like white against black? It felt like both a victory and a curse. Excusing himself to the library once the women had gone from the drawing-room, Darcy examined the turmoil in his brain. How could Miss Elizabeth's comment soothe and unsettle him? Was he so deficient of character, so set on the course he had charted from birth, that he had lost his humanity? He harumphed into the silence of the room. Rubbing against the fabric covering his chest, he paced from one end of the library to the other, Pausing to stare unseeingly out the window to the fog-laden autumn landscape, Darcy critically recalled each interaction with Miss Elizabeth. On the four different occasions he had been in her company, she had made him chuckle, smile and blush. There, he was not bereft of human feeling. He could be as happy as the next man. Surely. He huffed, his shoulders drooping as his hands hung to his side. Who was he trying to fool? Perhaps he had taken a few steps on his journey to finding joy in his life. Nonetheless, he had no doubt he had a long way to go. A journey of one thousand miles begins with a single step. A mile was... His mind quickly calculated the distance times one thousand. The number was staggering. What were two steps against so many? Yet he could not think that way. Two or three steps was not much, but it was a start. Miss Elizabeth was pleased to report on the slight improvement of Miss Bennet when she arrived downstairs for dinner. Because her sister was resting, she joined them in the drawing-room after. Choosing not to play whist, she instead picked up the book Darcy had left on the side-table next to the sofa, opening it to where he had marked the page. "'You're not to play cards!' Mr. Hurst was appalled with their guest's lack of competitiveness. She had much rather lose herself in a book, for Miss Elizabeth loves books beyond anything else, Miss Bingley added scornfully. I beg your pardon, Miss Bingley. I enjoy many things other than the pleasure of a good story. Miss Elizabeth closed Darcy's book and placed it back on the table. With that said, my father began reading to me the day after I was born, He read aloud one chapter of the Bible each morning until he finished on the last day of the year 1794. After completion, he selected Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. We have been reading together since. As the conversation continued, Darcy's mind did the math. The King James Version printed in the 1600s had 1,189 chapters. Counting backwards by month, he concluded Miss Elizabeth was born in September of the year 1771. She had reached her twentieth year only a few weeks past. 29th September 1771, he murmured aloud. Her head snapped up as her eyes met his. My birth date? How did you... Mathematics tend to come easily to me. Oh, Miss Elizabeth... Did you not know of Mr. Darcy's brilliance? He is never wrong. Never, she teased to Miss Bingley's rash comment. He cleared his throat. They were treading on uncomfortable ground. Miss Bingley is too generous in her compliments. You are not always right, Miss Elizabeth teased, the sparkle in her eyes lighting the room. I am not, Darcy stated with certainty. His errors had been grievous. Then I wonder, sir, which do you consider to be superior, a man who is right or one who is good? His heart almost pounded out of his chest. What a question to discuss. Did she have a theological bent, or was this needing a scientific approach? Possibly a mathematical equation, with calculations of qualities being the weight to influence the scales of justice— Darcy wanted to rub his hands together. This was the type of conversation to stimulate thinking and reason. He had not participated in the like since his father was alive, or since Cambridge. "'Miss Elizabeth, I believe you are confused,' 
Miss Bingley's voice and intrusion into a conversation not meant for her grated on him. They are one and the same, are they not? He was on stable ground. They are not. Standing from the card table, Darcy seated himself in a chair positioned across from their guest. A man of duty and honour strives to do what is right. When he does thus, it is good and fine in the eyes of other men, he offered. Yes, this is true, Miss Elizabeth agreed. He heard her hesitation as an almost imperceptible smile lifted the corners of her lips. Darcy continued. A good man would want to always do what was right. I agree. As to who is superior to whom, I could not say. As his mind considered all the angles available to his current thinking, it was the best he could do. Ah, a diplomatic conclusion, Mr. Darcy. You are a peacemaker. As Bingley laughed at the idea of his stoic friend suing for peace over proving himself the victor of a verbal battle, Darcy spied Miss Elizabeth's disappointment. Then he noted her confidence. His viewpoint had to have been wrong. Instead of being angry or embarrassed, he was elated. Pray tell me, Miss Elizabeth, who is superior, the good man or the man in the right? He sat back in his chair, crossed his legs, and rested his chin in his palm. While he appeared calm on the outside, his insides were quivering with delight. This was what he lived for. This was his joy. His love of learning and intellectual conversation had been like mother's milk to him from his infancy. He wanted to smile. As Caroline Bingley tusked at her guest's temerity at having the gall to suggest Mr. Darcy to be wrong, the man gave his full attention to the response. A man who strives to be righteous is a good thing, of this there can be no doubt. Miss Elizabeth chewed briefly on her bottom lip, a habit he hoped she repeated often. Nevertheless, a good man will go beyond the letter of the law for example, if the law requires a man not to strike a worker or a servant, a righteous man will refrain. A good man will take this a step further by seeing why a worker was not performing to his full potential and seek to relieve the suffering causing a problem. There is no law against punishing a servant, Miss Bingley inserted. Then let me clarify. Miss Elizabeth turned from Darcy and spoke to their hostess. A man or woman can be termed righteous if he fulfils his proper obligations, is just, impartial and honest. He is known for his integrity of conduct and uprightness. Your very comment defines Mr Darcy, Miss Bingley insisted. In his heart, Darcy agreed. Apparently Miss Elizabeth did not, for she added, but To be good, the individual would need to be righteous to the same extent as I mentioned, other qualities would distinguish him, such as benevolence, beneficence, and a wholesome consideration for and a desire to help others. Therefore, while the man noted for being right may win the respect, even the admiration of his peers, he may not appeal to their hearts so strongly as to impel anyone to do good to him. The good man, who is warm, helpful, considerate, merciful, and actively beneficent, would win affection. His goodness may appeal to the heart sufficiently that, for such a one, others would be willing and possibly desirous of coming to his aid or doing good to him. Darcy had to close his mouth from where his chin dropped almost to his chest. She was absolutely correct. That she had gained her point with precision, without being unkind, was an art. He looked between the two women. One had her feathers ruffled on his behalf. Was it done out of goodness, or out of the fear he would be offended and withdraw from her company where she could no longer pursue him? Goodness was not a quality he thought of when considering either of Bingley's sisters. Miss Elizabeth was not rejoicing at her success. Instead, she picked up the book from the table and reopened it to the marker. Sitting back in the chair, Darcy pondered what Miss Elizabeth had said. The discussion had cleverly distinguished between Bingley's personality and his, for Bingley was both righteous and good. Because of this, he made friends easily and kept those friends for lengths of time. 
Another step forward was this new resolve, settling in his heart, to be not just a man in the right. He, too, needed to be good. He could almost feel a thin tendril of warmth touch the corner of his heart. He looked at the young lady, with her head bent to her task. She was a marvel. He was learning lessons from her that would benefit him for the rest of his lifetime. At the same time, he was discovering the power of a smile, of a kind action or word. Would it be enough to thaw the organ so resistant to heat? Time would tell. Netherfield Park, Part 3 My good opinion, once lost is lost forever. Mr Darcy, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 11, Volume 1 The night was spent in silent reflection, mixed with short periods of deep sleep. By morning, Darcy knew what he needed to do. Kindness, no, rather goodness, required he temper his reactions to Miss Elizabeth. Surely he was raising expectations by showing a measure of interest in her. What was concentrated focus on his part might be assumed to be romantic involvement by her. This was not the case, clearly. After the discussion about a man's character, both Louisa and Caroline had displayed their talents on the pianoforte. Bingley had the carpets rolled back for an impromptu dance. With little provocation, Darcy had offered to stand up with Miss Elizabeth for a reel. She had declined, with an explanation that she needed to return to her sister's care. His ire was piqued. A stab from a needle would have been more welcomed at the time. Yet, in retrospect, he was grateful she had not acquiesced. On this day, her third day at Netherfield Park, he would avoid her. Thus, immediately after breakfast, and a ride around the property, he commandeered Bingley's study to catch up on somewhat pressing matters of business. He was interrupted by Bingley. "'Say, Darcy,' the younger man bounced on his heels— I forgot to tell you, the local bookseller had a shipment of books delivered that he'd purchased from the estate of a gentleman in Oxford. I know you were a Cambridge man, but I cannot imagine you would hold it against the boxes he just delivered to my library. I'd purchased the complete lot of them. To say Darcy was pleased would have been an understatement. He was joyous. Even should they be discarded university textbooks, they would be a welcome addition to the six books, taking up a pittance of the shelving available in the room. Deciding to oversee the discovery of the contents, both men stepped into the room, only to find Miss Elizabeth already there. She was seated away from the boxes in a discussion with the bookseller. A book appearing too new to come from a collection was already in her hands. The man stood and approached the crate at the very top of the heap in the centre of the room. Pulling one of the wooden slats from the top, he sorted through to find a worn leather volume, quite small in size. Dusting off the cover, The man's hands appreciatively caressed the book. Here it is, Miss Elizabeth. Her delight filled the room as she bounced up from the chair. In hushed tones, she whispered, her eyes glued to the cover. It is here. Darcy's curiosity burned through the restraints of propriety. Decorum indicated he ignore their exchange. However, he felt the same awe when a rare piece of literature rested in his own palms. He just had to know what she held reverently. It appeared she would not be easily separated from either tome. Pardon me, would that be part of Bingley's purchase? Well, that had not come out correctly. He had not meant to implicate her as a potential thief, taking something that did not belong to her. In response, Miss Elizabeth pressed the books to her chest. The bookseller shook his head back and forth. No, sir, this was not part of the transaction. Nor was the other one. Waving his hand to indicate the books in question, the man firmly and clearly stated, The popper owner is the lady. Darcy began again. Pray forgive me. I merely intended to inquire as to the title of the piece removed from the box. Why had he even bothered to open his mouth? He knew his propensity to blurt offensiveness when it came to her. Not handsome enough. Slighted by other men. Raising a quizzical brow, she replied with a slight lift of her pert nose. Volume 12 of Fables by Jean de La Fontaine and Sense and Sensibility, a novel by a lady. She enunciated the French title and author clearly, 
before turning from the men to sit in the far corner of the room so they could peruse the cartons undisturbed. She disturbed him. In fact, not two hours later, after each book had been placed on the library shelves, Darcy re-entered with the intention of discovering something of interest to pass the time. He had selected an appropriate topic to enjoy and comfortably seated himself before the fire when Miss Elizabeth stepped into the library, one of her books resting in her hand. He deliberately turned a page, irritated at being disturbed. When she barely acknowledged him, he buried his nose in the book, pretending he was unaffected. When she sat in a chair opposite his, he was appalled at her gall. Did she not realise he did not want to be bothered with company? He was reading, for heaven's sake, a quiet activity best undertaken in solitude. He glanced at her quickly to determine her intentions, fully expecting her eyes to be upon him. Ha! They were not. Instead, she leaned against the arm of the chair, one hand holding her book open, while the fingers of her other hand twirled a loose curl around and around. His eyes followed the movement, captured by the hypnotic path the rich tress wove with each twist. When a smile appeared at the corner of her lips, Darcy was ready to jump up and defend his right to privacy. How dare she invade his peace? However was a man to concentrate on... What was he... No, oh, the agricultural practices of ancient Rome, when she was twirling and twisting and being beguiling. Surely she should inherently know he did not want to be disturbed. Quietly huffing into the silence of the room, the realisation she was successfully and completely ignoring him was like a stab to his abdomen. How could she? He looked closer at her, marvelling at her temerity. The woman frustrated him and irritated him, and it hurt his gut that she could sit there in silence without one time glancing in his direction. Deciding to retire from the room and leave her without his company, he began to close his book and set it aside, when he was reminded of the last time he had been as petulant. Possibly he had been five or six years old and had been told no by his nanny. Oh, he was mad Miss Elizabeth interrupted him. Then he was mad she did not interrupt him. What a fool he was. Excuse me, he stated to no one in particular, as he vacated the room for another fast gallop over the fields. Fitzwilliam Darcy now considered himself not only hard-hearted, he was the most ridiculous man on earth. And she was wonderful. He avoided her the rest of the day. Not that it was his intention to avoid her, of course. She was merely a simple country miss with no portion, connections or fashion. He was Mr Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley, grandson of an earl, wealthy, educated and responsible. When Miss Jane Bennet appeared later that evening in company, Bingley fussed over her until everyone in the room was uncomfortable. Even Miss Elizabeth's face had a rosy hue at the excesses of their host's attentions towards her sister. Jane Bennet looked to be embarrassed, or perhaps she was seated too close to the fire. Miss Bingley apparently suffered for the considerations paid the Bennet sisters. Into the silence she mused, how pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way. She lifted the book she was holding from her lap. Darcy agreed. He was tired of cards and longed for some of the witty repartee exhibited by Miss Elizabeth. He almost held his breath to see if she would respond. She did not, instead giving her attention to Miss Bennet. Not to be gainsaid, Miss Bingley continued... I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. I mean, how much sooner one tires of anything than of a book. When I have a house of my own, I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library. Her brother took offence. Caroline, are you not grateful we've made a start with the books that arrive today? Instead of having a portion of one shelf covered, there are six shelves completely filled. She yawned and tossed her book aside without making a reply. Darcy watched her from the corner of his eye to see her next move. It was like looking at a beginning chess player against a master. Miss Bingley got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant, and she walked well. He could give her credit for a fine posture. 
when she turned to Miss Elizabeth and invited her to accompany her, Miss Bingley's final words moved the other young lady from her position next to her sister. Let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn about the room. I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. Darcy wanted to chuckle, for the only one who seemed uncomfortable in their situation was Miss Caroline Bingley. When Miss Elizabeth strolled next to her, Darcy's eyes followed each movement, the bend of her hip with each step, the extension of her foot, the slight swing of the arm not entangled with Miss Bingley's, the movement of her gown. The candlelight from the wall sconces flicked flames in the curls of her hair as she walked away from him and highlighted the shadows and curves of her cheekbones and jaw as she drew near. The desire to leap up and welcome her into his arms flooded him until his mouth dropped open and his fingers curled over the arm of the chair. Uncrossing his legs, he planted his feet firmly on the carpet. What was he about? Mr Darcy, would you join us? Miss Bingley inquired, with a confidence of his ready agreement. When her companion slightly tilted her head to the side, her eyes meeting his, he saw no welcome. He had wanted to say yes. Instead, he replied, I shall not, for I can enjoy your activity much better from where I am seated. Shocking! Caroline Bingley would do anything to draw his attention. Again, he wondered at Bingley. When would he take his sister under control? Miss Bingley, I do not understand your amazement. Miss Elizabeth patted her walking companion's arm. When has Mr Darcy done anything other than his own desire? I cannot begin to imagine he would choose us over his book. After all, I believe he agrees. There is no enjoyment greater than reading. Darcy snapped closed the book he had just selected from the small pile on the table next to his chair. Placing it back on the stack next to him, he said, I find enjoyment in many things. Such as? Miss Elizabeth. Darcy mentally retreated, choosing a defensive manoeuvre over the offensive. Tell me, other than reading, what is your pleasure? I dearly love a laugh, was her immediate reply. The ladies had stopped in front of him. Miss Bingley stepped towards him, while the other took a small step back. I cannot consider that a weakness. However, it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule. Darcy was cautious in his comment. He clearly comprehended Miss Elizabeth was his intellectual equal. Such as vanity and pride, she asked. Pride, where there is real superiority of mind, will always be under good regulation. When she looked away to hide a smile, he reconsidered his words. Had he misspoke? No, he had not. You consider yourself without defect? No, I do not, said Darcy. I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My temper can be too little yielding, my ability to hold on to resentment for the follies and vices of others is strong. My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. Well, that is a failing indeed, cried Miss Elizabeth. Nonetheless, I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. She returned to her chair. Your defect is a propensity to hate everybody. I cannot compete with such a fault. And yours, he replied with a smile, hearing the tease in her words, is willfully to misunderstand them. Tired of not being the centre of attention, Miss Bingley called to her sister to open the pianoforte for the evening's entertainment. Darcy, after a few moments' recollection, was not sorry for it. Miss Elizabeth Bennet had knocked him from his pedestal, and he was both perched precariously and teetering for a fall. He needed away from her. If he was not careful... The danger of paying Miss Elizabeth too much attention would give her expectations he had no desire to fulfil. Like Miss Bingley would never be his bride, he would not willingly select the second Bennet daughter to be the next mistress of Pemberley. Where he found the exchange of lively conversation to be stimulating mentally, his heart was untouched. However, he could no longer vouch for hers. After the Netherfield Ball 
I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. Elizabeth Bennet, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 18, Volume 1 Never did Darcy allow himself more than one brandy before retiring for the night. On this night, he was on his third, with no intention of stopping. The much-anticipated opportunity to stand up with Miss Elizabeth at the ball had been a disaster. He should have known. The two weeks after the departure of Miss Bennet and Miss Elizabeth from Netherfield Park had accomplished much in the training of Bingley to take oversight over his estate. His sisters were frantically trying to arrange a ball he had dropped into their laps with little time to prepare. Unfazed by their constant complaints, the men hunted birds for the table, rode from fence line to fence line, and visited neighbours, including the Bennets. One unpleasant note had occurred the day after the ladies left Bingley's house. A quick ride into Meryton had found all five Bennet girls in the company of officers from the newly arrived militia. One of them was the notorious George Wickham. Darcy's ire instantly roused, he had ridden away from the happily gathered group. Darcy had hoped he would not see the man again. Fortunately, until then, he had not. Unfortunately, Miss Elizabeth had not only seen the miscreant, she had apparently listened to Wickham's tales of woe against the Darcys of Pemberley. Pulling his cravat loose, he yanked it from his neck. How he loathed George Wickham! Darcy's former friend had pulled his father's attention away from his only son. He had torn the heart from his young sister's chest when he abandoned her in Ramsgate to disappointed hopes, and he had slashed whatever good opinion Miss Elizabeth had held of Darcy. The confrontation during their dance had been painful. Sighing loudly, Darcy took another sip of his beverage of choice. He had waited with eager anticipation for her to be free of her ungainly first partner so he could approach her with his invitation. With no doubt of her ready acceptance, he had stood before her, his hand extended. As she lightly touched his palm with her gloved fingers, a shiver of something he had never recalled experiencing before shot up his arm into the depths of his chest. His heart, that frozen organ he had feared would never beat properly again, pulsed in a rapid rhythm that made it difficult to take in his next breath. Who was this woman, and what was she doing to him? He smiled, then looked to the floor to make certain his feet were still touching the wooden surface, for he felt lighter than air. Then she spoke. Her words ripped through him faster than the charged current had done. Blast that Wickham! Nonetheless, while her unfair accusations during their set robbed him of joy, it was the one in the early hours of the next morning, as the ball was ending, that shot through his soul. Mr Darcy, are you to remain in Hertfordshire until the festal season? Her question was bold. He was surprised, since their conversation during the dance had not gone well. Her ire appeared to have been as stirred as his. However, out of politeness, Darcy sought an answer. His plans had been to stay at Netherfield Park another month, before returning to London to spend the holidays with Georgiana. Never had he been a man to reveal his schedule to anyone outside of those who would be personally impacted by his decisions. Yet he did not hesitate to respond. I will be leaving in four weeks. Twenty-eight days, six hundred and seventy-two hours. Before he could calculate the minutes, she inquired, stopping his brain from its mathematical spin. Will Mr Bingley and his family celebrate Christmas in our shire? I have no knowledge of him doing anything else. I see. She hesitated. I would imagine the hills of Derbyshire, heavily laden with snowfall, is a sight to behold. There would be nothing like an evergreen tree caked in white, and streams weaving like dark ribbons on a light fabric to delight the senses. He sucked in his breath. She was hoping for an invitation to Pemberley. He was sorry to disappoint. I will be at Darcy House in London with my sister. She is studying with several masters and does not want to miss any lessons by travelling north. Miss Elizabeth nodded in understanding. You are kindness itself for considering her preferences. What did she know of Georgiana? What had Wickham told her? Where the fast beating of his chest at the beginning of their dance together had been pleasurable, the tightness now squeezing his insides was painful. 
You have heard of my sister? Even he heard the wariness in his tone. I have. She looked him straight in the eye. Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst have been generous in their praise of Miss Darcy. Her words were inoffensive and true. He had heard Miss Bingley proclaim Georgiana's talents numerous times. Miss Elizabeth's tone was kindly and her smile unaffected. Certainly, Wickham had said nothing about the failed elopement. His sister's reputation was intact. The relief he felt was tremendous, moving him to continue engaging the young lady he was standing alongside. Will you be celebrating at Longbourn? Miss Elizabeth's attention had gone back to the dancers, where Bingley was again standing up with Miss Bennet. As she watched the movements, her body gently swayed to the music, her smile growing with each second her eldest sister spent with his friend. She seemed startled at his question. Yes, sir. She gazed back at him. Our relatives from London will travel to Hertfordshire for the week. Will you return with them to town? Why in the world did he ask that? Did he want her in London? Of course not. I have no plans to do so at this time. I see. Do you spend much time in London? Now he had her full attention. Her voice was sharper than he had expected. Both Jane and I have stayed at the home of my aunt and uncle in Cheapside. While there we visit museums, shops, the theatre, and whatever happens to pique our interests. Our relatives are the best of people. Nevertheless, we have no arrangements to leave Longbourn. Was that wistfulness? Was she hoping for an invitation? A guarantee they would further the acquaintance after he leaves? Surely she would not be so bold. Darcy admitted to some confusion. Where her words during their dance had been challenging, bordering on insulting, now they were conciliatory, almost friendly, as if their earlier conversation had not taken place. Yet he could not repine. When he left in December, he would miss their lively exchanges. He would miss observing her diverting responses to the insults of Miss Bingley with dignity and poise. He would miss the sparkle of her eyes and the... Oh, good heavens! She was attempting to ingratiate herself into his company. Next she would ask to meet his sister. Then she would be constantly underfoot, hoping for his attentions until she wore him down and he proposed. Excusing himself quickly, he retired from the ball. The danger was real. He had created expectations in a female uniquely unqualified to be the next mistress of Pemberley. Quick action would be required to extract himself safely from her grasp. He needed to leave for London immediately. Did he even want to? Of course he did. Rosings Park. My courage always rises with every attempt to intimidate me. Elizabeth Bennet, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 8, Volume 2. 127 days later, Darcy finally understood that the pleasant conversation in the ballroom was, in truth, a disaster. What he had taken for interest on her part in inquiring about his and Bingley's plans was in fact an interrogation by a skilled, ruthless investigator. Mr Darcy, are you to remain in Hertfordshire until the festal season? Will Mr Bingley and his family celebrate Christmas in our shire? I would imagine the hills of Derbyshire, heavily laden with snowfall, is a sight to behold. We have no arrangements to leave Longbourn. Seemingly innocent questions and comments, phrased to draw him into revealing what he normally kept to himself, so she could avoid him, not spend more time with him. Of course, Bingley was welcome. Darcy was not. She was sly. She was wily. She was a raving harridan. Darcy kicked a pebble as he marched from Huntsford Cottage to his aunt's estate of Rosings Park. When the rock skidded off into the grass alongside the road, his ire increased as he had desperately wanted to kick it again, hard, the four months he had been away from Miss Elizabeth's company had been a time of serious mental exertion for Darcy. Each time he thought of her, he would force himself to think on something else. Yet the task was impossible. If he was able to control his dreams of her during his waking hours, the dark hours of the night welcomed her into his heart with no restraint. 
He absolutely had not loved her. He could not. It was impossible. Then he saw her in Kent, and his traitorous heart finally convinced him he had only been fooling himself. He was completely in love with the idea of having Elizabeth Bennet for his wife. Like a military officer, in the manner of his own cousin Richard, Darcy plotted and strategized his approach. He first needed the opportunity to determine if he should propose courtship or marriage, then locate a romantic setting to make an offer that would bring her the greatest happiness. What had started as a pleasant surprise, spying her alone on one of the garden paths in her yellow dress, the colour of the water lilies, had turned into a fiasco unlike anything he had ever encountered before. When she had told him her favourite walking route, he had been gleeful. She wanted him to meet her in private. Ha! She had not wanted him there at all. His chest hurt. He had wanted... Oh, Lord! He had thought she wanted... Blast! How many times had he practised the words? Twice. He had practised his failed proposal two times. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. What in heaven's sake had she found so offensive? He loved her. Was that not good enough for her? Well, no more. He was done with her. Completely and irrevocably finished with Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Ha! Her middle name was probably Jezebel or some other hateful scheming... Inhaling sharply, he stopped in his tracks... She had cried. No, not the kind of tears where she had hidden her face in her hands. Rather, the tears streamed from her eyes as she glared at him, each droplet forced from an anger she was barely able to control. Not at first. Oh, no. Not until he reminded her of the inferiority and impropriety of her family did the first hint of moisture appear. Then she struck back, quicker than a viper after its prey. I have never desired your good opinion. Never? Not even during the days she had cared for her sister at Bingley's estate. How could he have misread her to this measure? Never? Not even once? He had been so sure, so certain of her response, that he had suffered the sweetest dreams during the many nights after they had wandered the trails and paths of Rosings Park together. Dreams of working together, raising a family guiding Georgiana through her presentation and seeing her off together when she wed. Nightmares, all of them. Alone on the gravel driveway in the darkness of night, the only sound to break the silence were the frogs croaking next to the pond and his pounding heart. Darcy fought to make some sense of his failure and her harsh words, which were running over and over in his mind. "'You are mistaken, Mr. Darcy, "'if you suppose that the mode of your declaration "'affected me in any other way "'than as it spared me the concern "'which I might have felt in refusing you "'had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. "'You could not have made me the offer of your hand "'in any possible way that would have tempted me to accept it. "'He was furious. How dare she! "'He had offered her everything she could never achieve on her own. "'From the time he had arrived upon this earth,' and the midwife had announced he was a son. He had been chased by mothers and daughters until his whole life he seemed to be running. Of all the females he could have selected to be Mrs. Darcy, she should have been the last one he asked. Yet she was the only one he wanted. Wickham and Bingley, these concerns overrode her sense of awe at his offer. How dare she throw the sad story George Wickham told and retold in Darcy's face? Had he not suffered enough at the hands of that rake? And separating Bingley from her eldest sister? Of course he had encouraged his friend to depart Netherfield Park. Why would he not? Miss Jane Bennet gave no indication she had a personal attachment to Bingley. Would he had been as kind to himself as he had been to his friend? Darcy rubbed his chest. Dropping his chin, he forced himself to ponder a future without her. His heart... That treacherous organ with what felt like lightning bolts shooting through it had failed him. The subtle thawing of his frozen, frigid internal ticker had been for naught. Wishing he had never started on this journey of a thousand steps, Darcy returned to Rosings to suffer his pain, alone. 
Early the next morning, Darcy wandered the grove in hopes of seeing her again. Not that his hopes were joyous. He knew the sight of her would renew the agony he had struggled with during the hours he paced word after painful word on the parchment to enlighten Miss Elizabeth as to the motives behind his actions. His first sight of her robbed him of his breath. When she looked like she would turn and run, he hailed her, his voice easily travelling the distance in the stillness of the morning. Miss Elizabeth, will you do me the honour of reading this letter? He thrust the envelope at her, afraid she would refuse. He looked at her, truly looked. Dark shadows lurked under her eyes. The sparkling liveliness he had assumed he would see was replaced with red-rimmed eyes and a pinched look about her mouth. He, Fitzwilliam Darcy, had done this to her. Might I have a moment of your time before you... before you read my letter? Pray do not be concerned that I would renew the addresses you found repellent last evening. Her eyes surveyed his face before she replied. How might I help you, sir? May we walk? Gesturing towards the path leading to the pond, he waited for her to take her first step, before he turned to move alongside her. Feelings and words tangled to the point Darcy was unable to sort them into any semblance of order. Finally, realising he had nothing else to lose, he blurted, Have you ever read the papers of John Cabot or Henry Hudson? The Explorers? Yes. Inhaling deeply through his nostrils, he blinked, then continued, Both men made comments about the beauty and majesty of ice glaciers. They were pristine and serene in their solidity. Nevertheless, on occasion, as they moved towards the ocean, the noise that same piece of ice could make was highly disturbing. This happened when heavy blocks of ice broke off a massive glacier and dropped into the sea. They, both men, described the sound as being like a loud groan that seemed to last an eternity, which was almost painful to hear. She nodded, but did not look at him. Darcy cleared his throat. Often the iceberg would violently surge back onto the land, crashing into what had once been its home. Now she was looking at him, undoubtedly confused at his topic. Pray, bear with me. I seek to make a point. The slight tilt of her head and lift of her brow encouraged him to continue. As rough a start as that large piece of ice had, the salient fact is, Miss Elizabeth, within a period of time, as the ice flows away from the glacier, it eventually melts into the sea, until again there is calm. She stopped, took several breaths, then looked up at him. Am I to assume from this that you are thinking eventually you and I will have peace? Peace would be my wish. He bowed. In retrospect, I recognise I was harsh in my expressions. Violently so. You were not alone, sir. Miss Elizabeth, I alone bear guilt. Deservedly so. Of its own, his hand reached out to touch her arm. He stopped it before he felt the velvet of her spencer. Like the iceberg, once it melts into the sea, the current transports the melted water far to the south, where it never returns to the glacier. I suspect we shall never be in company again. Desperately, he wanted to see regret on her beautiful face. Instead, all he saw was calm acceptance, possibly relief. What had been left of his heart was ripped from his chest. He could no longer look at her, nor speak. Bowing, he turned and walked away from the only woman he would ever love. His journey of a thousand steps was over. Pemberley Though some people may call him proud, I have seen nothing of it. Mrs Gardiner, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 1, Volume 3 She was there. Never in his wildest dreams had he thought to find Miss Elizabeth Bennet touring his estate in Derbyshire. Yet she was there. Determined she would see for herself that he was no longer the haughty man who had proposed to her in Kent, he hurried his valet along to have Darcy presentable after three long days on the road. He did not want to approach her and her friends, smelling of manly sweat and horseflesh. 
Although he felt like he was making a formal call, he chose to dispense with his hat, coat and gloves. It was his home, and it was almost the end of July, three months and twelve days since he had last looked upon her lovely face. Mrs Reynolds, his housekeeper, and Mr Miller, his steward, both had wanted his attention. Despite understanding their needs, after all, he had not been at Pemberley for months, he had one thing on his mind, or rather, one person. When his gardener quickly pointed towards the path around the lake, Darcy decided then and there to give the man an increase in salary. Within five minutes he was able to approach Miss Elizabeth and her two companions as they strolled the pathway. The months of heartache were almost at an end. He determined to put his best self forward, to display a changed attitude to the only woman he could love. In his eagerness, he had failed to plan what he would say. How could he reveal the personal upheaval he had experienced during the weeks following his proposal? The instant he had walked away from her at Rosings, ice had returned to encapsulate Darcy's heart with an almost impenetrable frost. Scorfell Pike in the southern fells of Cumbria during the coldest months of winter, with its top heaped with snow, could not have been more frigid than the inside of Darcy's chest. Despite this, as a man of honour, he had needed to give attention to the flaws she had so brutally exposed. It was what was right and just. To be a good man he had to work through the misery of being still alone in spite of his desires. As he walked closer to her, he wondered, had she even read his letter? Would she be able to look beyond his angrily written justification to cease placing blame on him for the decisions Wickham or even Bingley made? Would she welcome him or scorn him? What if she had not read his carefully penned missive? He had no way of knowing until he spoke with her, until he was close to her. She was beautiful. Her dress was the same blue as the sky, but it was her dark eyes against her sun-kissed skin and her pearly white teeth in a smile, not a scowl, that had him mesmerised. Good afternoon. Welcome to Pemberley. He bowed to the visitors. Miss Elizabeth, might I have an introduction to your companions? Mr Darcy, your housekeeper informed us you were not at home. A telltale blush rose from her neck to the apples of her cheeks. Pray do not be concerned, Miss Elizabeth. You will always be welcomed here. His chest throbbed at his own boldness. Could his message have been any clearer? Surely not. He looked to the older couple with her. They were fashionably well-dressed in comfortable clothing. Both had excellent posture and manners. Mr and Mrs Gardiner were pleasant and appeared unaffected by the wealth surrounding them. Instead, like Miss Elizabeth, they saw the beauty of which Darcy was exceedingly proud. Mr Gardiner noted the fat fish in the stream leading into the lake. Mrs Gardiner studied the wildflowers at the water's edge. They chose to spend time standing on the bridge over the stream, watching the water flow. This allowed Darcy to speak with their niece, with a measure of privacy. Mr Darcy, please accept my apology. We would not have come had we known the family was in residence. Her eyes were turned to the ground. Darcy would not have her humbled before him. He gestured to the pathway. She must not have seen his offered arm, as she started walking alongside him without accepting his overture. Miss Elizabeth, I believe I could not have withstood the disappointment had I missed you and your relatives. Her reaction, the slight nod of her head, stirred his heart. Small pieces of ice were breaking away from the glacier that had long resided inside him. With her gentle smile, a large chunk, like those spied by Hudson and Cabot, dislodged and fell to the pit of his stomach. He knew his weaknesses. Hiding behind his pride and arrogance had been comfortable to him. This open exposure made him nervous. However, it was necessary. Might I inquire how long you will be in Derbyshire? We will be here another four days. My aunt grew up in Lampton. She's taken the opportunity to revisit the places from her youth, as well as catching up with old acquaintances. Miss Elizabeth chuckled. Not that they are old, of course. She delighted him. On the morrow, the rest of my party will be arriving. Some, the Bingleys, you know. 
another my young sister Georgiana is travelling with them. If I may, I would be pleased to provide an introduction, if you would allow it. It would be my pleasure, sir, to receive the introduction, and to greet the Bingleys. He cleared his throat of the giant frog that had lodged there. You might be wondering if I had yet spoken to Bingley about Miss Bennet's being in London for the winter. At her nod, he said, I have not, as he left London while I was in Kent to visit family in Manchester. We reunited on the road yesterday. My sister travels in a separate coach from Bingley and his sisters. I had wondered whether you had explained the error. She sighed. I will admit that I had hoped you had not, since he chose not to return to Netherfield Park. Had you told him, and he had not come to Hertfordshire, then all of Jane's hopes would have been for naught. Darcy hesitated, because he knew his next question could be the source of great pain, and a potential for explosive anger on her part. He stopped and faced her. As Miss Bennet, is she well? When Miss Elizabeth's head dipped, he was unable to see her expression, thus he could not gauge her reaction. Her heartbreak has been a source of despair. Her voice was barely above a whisper. I am very sorry to hear it, about one you believe has a tender heart. Darcy rubbed his fingers over his mouth, aware he was being gifted an opportunity to see if he had any future with the young lady in front of him. Miss Elizabeth, pray forgive my daring, but I must ask after your own heart. My heart? Yes, for the information I shared in my letter had the power to hurt you. Me? Indeed. When she lifted her face to him, there was no teasing lilt to her eyes and mouth. It was time to make peace with her, and to possibly settle his own future. Should she still be set against him, he would have to learn how to give her up. His hands started to quiver, so he clasped them to keep them under control. I well know how Wickham can charm his way into the affections of those with innocent minds. Learning of his true character must have pierced your tender feelings. I wished... I never wanted to hurt you, Elizabeth, either by word or deed. In retrospect, everything I said to you during my proposal and in my letter had to have stirred up immense pain. I am deeply sorry to have been the cause of your suffering. When she turned from him, his lungs failed him. Those few seconds before she looked back at him were the worst in his life. When she slowly shook her head, he was confused. When she stepped closer, he... Well, he did not recognise the emotions pouring through his soul. Mr Darcy, the only pain I felt was the embarrassment of realising I was not nearly as wise as I had assumed. She scoffed at herself. Resting her palm on her chest, she clarified... Looking back on the conversations I had with Mr. Wickham, after studying your words carefully, I concluded there was little basis for my believing his tales of woe, for they were indeed fictitious tales. Nonetheless, I became a willing compatriot because his charges against you fed my own vanity, which had been laid low from your comment at the Meryton Assembly about my appearance being not handsome enough to tempt you. While I had no desire to tempt anyone, in particular a gentleman I knew little about, I pridefully allowed my prejudice to be nourished by what he said. I am now ashamed of my opinions. He was stunned. She read the letter and understood his intentions. But the result was simply not acceptable to him. Please do not be so harsh upon yourself. You have no reason to accept blame for the evil deeds of others. Rather, discern as I have that we have no power to undo what has already been done. Her eyes did not even blink, such was her focus on him. Nerves threatened to overcome his ability to form words. My goal, since Rosings, has been to become a good man, as you had eloquently defined when speaking with Miss Bingley. Rather than taking the failed outcome of my proposal as reason to become bogged down in the mire of my own inadequacies, I chose instead to become the very man my father intended me to become. How are you doing with that, Mr. Darcy? At the slight lilt in her voice, he appreciated her tease, which allowed him to relax. I am standing before you a work in progress. 
he splayed his hands from his side and returned her smile. Mr. Darcy, you called me Elizabeth. It is how I think of you. Her head tilted as she considered his reply. Giving a nod of acceptance, she asked, Sir, on the morning you delivered your letter into my hands, you posed an illustration gleaned from the explorers of past generations. Do you recall? The iceberg. Yes. She brushed a wisp of a curl from her cheek, where the slight breeze had caused it to alight. They stopped at the far end of the pond. I left your company that morning, confident I would never see you again. He nodded, having felt the same. Yet here we are, most unexpectedly in conversation, two drops of water in the same sea. Do you not feel we are tempting the elements by our lives coming back together so soon after parting? Soon? He offered his arm, which she willingly took, then resumed their walk on the pathway. Every long minute since I left you in the glen has crept by in agonising slowness. This I am sorry to hear. Pray do not be, for in truth I needed the days, hours and minutes to pass. At the quizzical lift of her brow he explained, Something else the explorers observed was the impossibly long length of time it took for a piece of ice to melt that contained debris. Compared to a clear wedge of ice similar in size, the process of metamorphosizing from the iceberg to drops of water took several extra days to disappear into the sea. Thus, because I had much that was foul inside of me, I had to root it out before I could live with myself. The process could not be rushed. Sir, with that said, the ice still melted. He appreciated her sentiments and the smile with which it was accompanied. Yes, it did. They caught up to where Mr. and Mrs. Gardner still stood, so the theme of their conversation ended. Despite wishing they could speak together for hours, Darcy appreciated all that had been freely addressed between the two of them. Was it a new beginning for him and Elizabeth? He did not know. What he was absolutely certain of was that he loved her more than he had claimed during his proposal at Huntsford Cottage. He was convinced he would humbly do anything within his power to see to the happiness of Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Two days later, his convictions were put to the test. To London, then Longbourn. I love him. Indeed, he has no improper pride. He is perfectly amiable. Elizabeth Bennet, Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 17, Volume 3. Lydia Bennet had run off with George Wickham. All of his dreams raised at seeing Elizabeth continue at Pemberley had faded into nothingness upon her receipt of a letter from Jane with the horrid news. How could Elizabeth and Lydia possibly be sisters from the same parents? This was a question Darcy pondered through the weeks of searching for Wickham and the foolish youngest Bennet girl, arranging for Wickham to have a commission in the regulars and a marriage to the stupidest child in England, and mourning the separation from the woman he loved. He was afraid he had not handled the news of the elopement well. Elizabeth was in tears as she quickly related all that would befall the Bennets at Lydia choosing to throw her hand in with the devil himself. Darcy felt it was his duty to protect the two eldest sisters from as much harm as possible. Instead of remaining in Elizabeth's company, after she read the terrible report from Longbourn, he had immediately departed to begin the search for the rogue couple. He had given her no reassurance that this circumstance had not altered his affections. He had not told her of his feelings. Instead, his sole focus had been doing everything within his power to ease her torment. Fool. Therefore it was weeks before he had an opportunity to speak with Bingley, to confess his blatant interference with his friend's interest in Miss Jane Bennet. By then, Darcy had talked himself out of the hints Elizabeth had given him at Pemberley, that her affections and wishes had changed in his favour. Surely any positive inclination was now gone. How could she give herself to a man who had neglected to warn her family about the evil propensities of George Wickham, who was now her brother by marriage? It was in every way reprehensible. Thus, after a lengthy discussion, whereupon Darcy confessed his great sin in separating Bingley and Miss Bennet, as well as hiding her presence in London, 
when Bingley requested Darcy's presence to support his return to Netherfield Park in Hertfordshire. It was with a heavy heart that Darcy denied the invitation. As added inducement, Bingley said, "'Now that I've removed Caroline to our aunts in Cornwall, I will be able to offer Jane a home of peace where she can be queen of my castle. "'I am proud of you, my friend.' Darcy was exceedingly pleased at Bingley's developing a backbone and standing firm for his future happiness. Whether Caroline Bingley was at Netherfield Park or not mattered no more. I wish you happiness. He almost choked on the words, If only. The day he received notice from Bingley of his attachment to Miss Bennet, Darcy's aunt Lady Catherine de Bourgh entered his home like a tornado bent on destruction. That girl! His aunt paced his study with no care for any response to her rant. That shrewish miss, who presumes to better herself by attaching herself to our exalted family. That impertinent, ungrateful Bennet Tart, who accuses me of insulting her in every possible method. How dare she! She, who is determined to pollute the shades of Pemberley, to forego the claims of duty, honour and gratitude. She, the chit, is determined to ruin our family in the opinion of all of our friends and make us the contempt of the world. Spinning, she pointed her finger at him, shaking it as if he was the one whom she held in anger. What do you intend to do about this, Darcy? Will you allow this upstart to continue to defile our good name by attempting to attach herself to you? For when I asked directly if she would promise never to enter into an engagement... She would not. Can you believe her arrogance? Without remorse, she stood in front of me like a stone tower, her arms folded in pride, and a look of defiance on her countenance. I took no leave of her, and resolved to approach you so we can join together to remove this threat. She cannot be worked upon. Elizabeth. His Elizabeth Bennet had stood firm against the ire of his aunt. He could hardly breathe, as a frisson of hope wove its way from one chamber in his chest to the other. By the time his aunt's threats had fully penetrated his brain, he called for his carriage to be readied and his bags to be packed. I vow to take care of this immediately, he promised, as he left Lady Catherine standing in the middle of his study. I had no doubt you would, was her reply. Darcy could not keep the grin from his face. As he ascended the stairs to his chambers, he calculated how long it would take before they arrived in Hertfordshire. Only for a brief moment did he worry about his aunt's suffering when she found out the truth. He would humble himself to the extent necessary to guarantee Miss Elizabeth Bennet would become Mrs Fitzwilliam Darcy. For once, the math was easy. One plus one equaled two. Perfect. Fortunately for him, the late August days were long. Bingley was at the home of his beloved. Within a few short minutes after arriving in Hertfordshire, Darcy mounted his horse for the ride to Longbourn to inform his friend he had a guest and to see Elizabeth. It was with delight Darcy spied both Bingley and Elizabeth strolling with Miss Bennet in the garden outside Longbourn. Instead of entering the house to present himself to Mr and Mrs Bennet as was proper, Darcy handed over his horse and headed directly to where he most wanted to be. If he could go by first impressions, he would be married within a month. However, Elizabeth's initial response quickly faded, which made his heart throb. Once the greetings were dispensed with, Bingley and Miss Bennet walked to the left where the path diverged. Darcy and Elizabeth went right. Is all well at Longbourn? It was not the most brilliant of questions, yet it was all he could come up with. The mere presence of the lady tied his tongue into knots. Sir, pray allow me to thank you for all you did for my errant sister. While much can be blamed on the exuberance of youth, the majority of fault lies with her selfish foolishness. To attach herself to such a man, I cannot conceive of a happy resolution for either of them. Discomfort made him fidget. Stopping by a bench, which was secluded under a wisteria arbour, they sat in silence. Truly he had not wanted to address this subject, but he should have known Elizabeth would not shy away from an unpleasant topic. Despite having a much more interesting task to perform, 
that of wooing the fair lady, he responded, If you must thank me, only do so for yourself, as I thought only of you. Mr. Darcy, I... Did you enjoy Pemberley? he interrupted, deciding he had said all that needed to be said. Would you ever like to return? She shook her head slightly, while the corners of her lips turned down. You will not allow me to grovel, to express my sincere appreciation for all you have done, while I, who have been wrong, so terribly wrong, attempt to find the words to adequately express how much better of a person you are than me. Mr. Darcy, you are unfair. No, I am fair, he insisted. I see no benefit to either of us to argue over who holds the larger burden of error. We can do nothing to undo what has been done, nor can we change the decisions others have made. Why? All of her reticence was gone. He studied her face closely. Her eyes sparkled. The blush on her cheeks was a lovely shade of light rose. Her beautiful lips were not pinched. When she tilted her chin up to look directly at him, he thought he saw welcome. However, he had been wrong before. Deciding to leave nothing to chance, he asked again, Would you like to return to Pemberley? She did not hesitate. I would. He felt the cold restraints in his chest loosen. Elizabeth, if you came and I asked you to stay, would you? Yes, she whispered for his ears only. Forever? Yes. Then you feel differently about me than you did at Huntsford in April? I do. Differently enough to allow me another opportunity to appeal to your heart with mine. I would love nothing better, Mr. Darcy. Fitzwilliam. Then I would love nothing better, Fitzwilliam. She smiled, the red deepening in her cheeks, as the chunks of ice broke away completely from his rapidly beating heart. Removing his gloves, he placed them on the bench. Taking her hands, first one, then the other, he pulled the fabric from each finger until her palms rested on his own. Any morsel of chill, any fragment of ice, evaporated into nothingness. For the first time in years he felt free, free to feel the good emotions life offered, free to love. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, when I told you in Kent that I ardently admired and loved you, I meant every word I uttered. Yet when I look back on the condition of my heart at the time, I realised it was a selfish sort of love I was seeking. Where I valued you then, I treasure you now. You, my dear woman, hold the key to my heart. No, that was not entirely correct. The key to my heart is a trite phrase for romantic fools, of which I am the foremost. He chuckled to himself. What I should have said, my Elizabeth, is you are the fire to my ice, the heat to my cold. Through you, because of you, I am attempting to become the man I am supposed to be, one I can have true pride in being. He kissed her fingers one by one. Before I came to Netherfield Park, the icy stone in my heart left me hurt and alone. I was adrift and unable to see comfort and kindness where it was offered. Then I met you. Oh, she sighed. I want you for my wife, Elizabeth. But more than that, I need you as my mate. Never do I want to return to the stoic, unapproachable man who thought more of himself than he should. Instead, I yearn to be yours, to have and to hold under whatever circumstances life tosses our way. He slid from the bench to his knee. I love you, Elizabeth, with my whole heart, soul, mind and strength. Will you do me the great honour of becoming Mrs Fitzwilliam Darcy, mistress of Pemberley and keeper of my heart? You eloquent man! She raised his hand to her lips. When we spoke at Pemberley, I noticed the softened edges of your character. Those edges appealed to me. When I found out about Lydia's error with Mr Wickham, I feared the potential for reproach would forever keep us separate. This, above all other things, broke my heart. I was unworthy, and I could not possibly have reason for hope. When Mr Bingley returned to Hertfordshire without you, I was crushed. 
for by then I knew you to be the only man I would ever want. Elizabeth, I was unworthy, until my aunt invaded my privacy and shared your response to her insistence that we never become engaged. I, too, felt without hope. She laughed. I believe Lady Catherine would be horrified to learn she was the instrument of bringing us together, rather than keeping us apart. She inhaled deeply, then expelled the air quickly, speaking immediately. I love you too, Fitzwilliam, with everything I am. The honour of becoming Mrs Darcy would be mine. He forgot to inhale. Instead, of their own accord, his lips lowered to hers. The gentle touch of his skin on hers, the taste and smell of her sweetness, was the healing balm he needed to make firm his transformation. His frozen heart was warm, pulsing, beating as it should. The journey of a thousand miles that had begun the night he first caught sight of Elizabeth was now at an end. From that day forward, they would travel together. The End This has been His Frozen Heart, a Pride and Prejudice novella, written by Christy Capps, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman, Copyright 2019 by Joy D. King. Production copyright by Quiet Mountain Press, LLC.